He wanted to do something, something safer. So he took a job carrying a mail in the winter from Placerville up and over the Sierra Nevadas. And uh, now I saw a picture of him once. And he had these, these skis that were 10 feet tall. He called them his snow skates. And um, his friends told him that he had to be careful because with as fast as he would go, he might someday break his neck. And he, well, he paid them no mind because he had the heart of a lion. And it turns out that, and it's something I can't quite figure out, he could go just as fast up the mountain as he could go down the mountain. He could go just as fast both ways. Well, one winter, it was so cold that the, the mountains had to wear snow caps. And, and it was, there was so much snow that it, it filled up the valleys and the, and the uh, canyons all the way up to the very tippy top. But it made it easy for my uncle to ski all the way up and down those mountains. Well, on one trip, he was skiing up the mountains and halfway up, there was a mountain cat sitting in his path. And it was sitting there all sad and mangy. And it, and it had this, now I should tell you that he had seen this mountain cat before. And uh, over the past couple of years, it seemed to be kind of falling him now and again. And that cat had always had this look in his eye like it wanted something from my, from my uncle. And my uncle thought, well, <laughs> he thought it was going to be him. So he took his skis and he pointed them and he went around that snow cat up and over the mountain. And he delivered his 100 pounds of mail. And then uh, on the way back with his next 100 pounds of mail, he got all the way up to the top of the summit. And, uh, and, and he looked down and well, there was this freezing wind at his back. And, and it was a kind of wind where you, your jacket needs a jacket and your jacket needs a jacket for you to stay warm. And he was afraid he was going to freeze. So he pointed his skis downhill and down, down in his path was that, that sad, mangy mountain cat just looking up at him. And so he pointed his skis a different way. He remembered the valley of the 500 foot trees, the tallest trees in the world. And he figured he could find cover there. So he pushed off and went straight down that mountain. Well, that went, that winter wind, it was, it was freezing when it was pushing at him. It was pushing and pushing. And, and he was going faster and faster and faster. And, and his feet there started getting warm and warmer and warmer until they got hot. He looked behind him and there was this flame of fire coming from behind him. And, 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 and with that winter freezing though, it, it froze that flame as soon as it started. And by the time he got down to the bottom, there was this streak of fire, frozen solid blue. Well, where he was at, he must have missed that valley of the 500 trees because there was only snow and there was no valley. And, and uh, well, there was only one small tree, it looked like a little Christmas tree off the side. So needing cover, he skied over there and uh, he took off his mail pack and he tied it to the tree and he tied his skis up to the treetop. And then uh, it was getting late, so he built himself a fire and he laid down in the snow and fell fast asleep. Well, when he woke up in the morning, he was surrounded by snow and his back was to the very hard ground. And he was looking up and that little Christmas tree had grown 500 feet tall. It seems as though that fire he built had melted him all the way down to the bottom of that, of that, that where that tree was. Now he knew he had to get out, but, um, but he had tied his skis and his mail to the top of that tree. So having the heart of a lion, he climbed up that tree, it took him two days and he took naps along the way. And he said that sleep in the tree was, was really for the birds only. And by the time he got to the top, he put on that mail bag and he took his skis and he, and he put them in his mouth and well, um, uh, now, I want you to know he carried them lengthwise, not up and down. He put them in his mouth and he climbed all the way back down the bottom. And when he got down the bottom, he realized he climbed back down into the hole and he knew he had to get out. So he stepped and stepped to the left. He stepped and stepped to the left, doing that lightning sidestep dance I told you about earlier. And he kept going around and around, getting higher and higher, packing down that snow until he climbed out of that, that hole at the very top. And then there in front of him, just a snowball throw away, was that was that mangy, sad uh, uh, mountain cat just looking at him. And my, my, my uncle, he was so tired, just threw up his hands. Is it me that you want? Is it me? And that, that mountain cat, it, 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 it shook its head, no. And then with its nose, it pointed at my, my uncle's pocket, uh, his front pocket, and, and, uh, and he reached down in it, and he paused for a moment. If I give this to you, will, will you will you leave me be? And that mountain cat, it, it it shook its head, yes. And so he pulled out, and he unwrapped. He held in his hand the heart of a lion, and he threw it like a snowball. That mountain cat, and that mountain cat caught it in its mouth, and no longer did that mountain cat look mangy or sad, but look strong and confident. And it ran as fast as fast could be off into the distance until it was gone. Now that mountain cat and its brothers and sisters from then on became known as mountain lions 
And that's how mountain lions got their name. As for my uncle, he went down to Placerville, turned in the mail, but from then on, he wasn't as fast and he wasn't as strong, but uh, he did that job for 20 some odd years. And as for the, the, the valley of the, the, the 500 foot trees, the, the tallest in the world, well, I'm sad to say when it came uh, at the, at, during springtime as the snow began to melt, well, so too did that streak of fire that was frozen, it melted too into flaming hot and it burned everything down to the very ground. Now, I'd like to leave you with this saying that my uncle used to say, it doesn't take the, the heart of a lion to do great things, but it sure does help. Thank you. Great story. <laughs> All right, thank you, Eric, for taking us on that journey. So we're gonna take about a minute here to let the judges just think about the story and um, evaluate the areas that they're gonna look for. So while we're doing that, Eric, can you say just a little bit more about um, your storytelling, what you've done or what you're interested in right now? Sure, so right now I'm interested in uh, just tales from the past. I, I tried once upon a time, I tried did a lot of folk tales, but uh, these days I typically try to find uh, stories that people have forgotten that uh, that are clever, uh, that are just kind of tucked away. You know, a lot libraries are full, filled with them. So, um, and this story happens to be a combination of several tall tales all pieced together. So, and by the way, I call it Lion is the title, Lion. Lion. The third. <laughs> Excellent. Love it. Okay, let's see. I think we are ready to move on for Well, our... I just wanted to ask, did Eric see the time? Oh. Eric, what hard, you mean? Yes. Yes, we had seven minutes and 30 seconds, correct? Just. Right, and yep. I made it under that, right? Just. Yes, of course. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so so was it easy? Was it easy for you to see the time frame from what she was? Yes, doing? it was. Okay. Great. Okay, we're ready to roll on here, Karen. All right. So our next storyteller comes to us from thirty years with Toastmasters, and she's part of the Storymasters group in Los Angeles. She is a retired from corporate finance and she has her own company right now called Catherine's Creative Communication Company that works towards aspiring youth to improve their public speaking skills and their leadership skills. So please welcome Catherine Magruder. Are you on mute? Yep. We can hear you. We'll start right now. If ye be going to Scotland, ye be hearing the tale of Angus Haggis. So he saved his wife, Merida, a newborn babe in the womb. It was a moonless night, dark and dreary, with a rainstorm of the likes that had no been seen in a hundred years when his wife, Merida, went into labor. The midwives, they'd been worried all along, worried that the doctor would not get the wrong time, worried that the babe would be too big to birth, too big, because Angus was the tallest, the biggest, and the strongest man in all of Scotland. He was so tall, he could leap the English Channel in one leap. He was so big, he could bear a hug a whole village. And he was so strong, he could wrestle the Loch Ness Monster to the bottom of the lock. It's why you don't see the monster anymore. It's a shame. And it turns out that that night, 
moonless, dark, and dreary, with our instrument the likes that had not been seen in a hundred years. Merida went into labor, the doctor was not there, and the babe was too big for birth. It was then that I won up the head midwife spoke. Angus, Angus, open the door of the roof. Angus, open the door in the roof. Angus, ye have got to be gone for 33, 33 Dunsbury Road, London, England, to get Dr. McGregor. Angus, not wanting to be gone, but knowing he had to be gone, closed the door in the roof. And in three leaps, went from Edinburgh, Scotland, to London, England. Pretty tree, pretty tree, drums found it. And in one wee spin, was at the doctor's house. Doctor McGregor, doctor. No answer. Angus, not being a patient man, lifted the roof of the house. You can be sure Dr. McGregor looked up there. Now, Angus, seeing that the doctor was old and slow, put the roof back on the house, picked up the whole house, and in three leaps, went from London to Edinburgh, put the house down next to his, watched as the midwives took Merida to the doctor's house. And Angus waited. And he waited. And he waited. Angus, not being a patient man, lifted the roof off the house. <gasps> oh no, it was not looking good for Merida. This when the doctor thought, laughter is the best medicine. So he told the joke. What's, what's the difference between a lawnmower and big pipes? No answer. You can tune a lawnmower. First, the midwives started laughing. And then Angus started laughing. And then Merida started laughing. And there was a rumbling, a rumbling in her stomach. And it got louder. And then the babe was laughing and oh, 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 shoot, the babe shot out right into Angus's room, the little baby. And then there was more rumbling in there the stomach and more laughing. And then whoosh, boom, boom, out popped another babe that Angus caught and it was a little messy. And that's how Angus saved his wife, Merida, and newborn babes in the womb. Oh, and Dr. McGregor, too. Thank you. Uh, that was a fun story. Bravo. Yes, thank you so much. Scotland, love your accent. Um, and Scotland, I I have been to Scotland, and I've always been interested in that Loch Ness monster, and, and now I know how to wrangle it and uh, find that guy. Excellent <laughs> story. And so, can you tell us uh, just a little bit about yourself while we have while the judges are um, evaluating? Well, I I'm a native Californian, and yes, Story Masters, and I want to thank. 
my story master friends for being here to support me. I also have published a book and I have three children, Henry, Rachel, Lee, and I made a decision to write a book about each of them. And so Henry and I have a strong affinity with Santa Claus. So I wrote a book, When Henry Met Santa Claus. And then Rachel, I'm working on her book. She played Little League Baseball. And so it's When Rachel Played Little League Baseball. And Lee, I'm still working on his, an idea for his book. So thank you. Thank you for asking. What, um, what age group would the, those books be for, mostly? Well, they're for, um, for Henry's book, for Santa Claus. I wrote it especially for first and second graders. And keep that spirit of Santa Claus alive. Definitely. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I think judges, we're ready to go for the next person here. So the next storyteller is... Colleen Bolin, and I met her at the Seattle Storytellers Guild. Um, I'm going to listen to the really great story by her. Uh, she lives, I think you live in Ellensburg, though, right? Is that correct? No, that's Marty. Oh, that's Marty. Okay. Yeah, I think she was supposed to be next if you want to do it in the order. Yeah, Marty's next. And oh, I'm sorry. It is Marty. I'm, okay. Yeah. yeah, so this is Marty. Uh, fall short, excuse me. Um, so she is from Seattle and a member of the uh, National Storytelling Network. And she's fairly new to the storytelling community. She's working on honing her skills. She loves folklore. And she's a retired teacher that used stories a lot in her teaching career. So please welcome Marty Fallshore from Ellensburg, Washington. Hi, thank you. My husband Dale and I are hiking in the Himalayas on a 10-day hiking trip in Nepal in the Himalayas. It's one of those old people hiking trips where all we have to carry is water and snacks and money and room for things that we buy. And they haul all our stuff from town to town and end to end. Right now, we're on our fifth day. We're about halfway through one of our longer hikes and it's springtime and just beautiful here. On the trail, it's a relatively narrow trail. And to the right, if you look up, it's just mountain. And to the left, if you look down, it's also just mountain. And we're hiking along, it's getting to be lunchtime, and I see a trail going up the side of the mountain, which indicates there must be a town up there. So we start scrambling up this really steep trail, rocks coming down on us, uh, so we're far apart from each other. And we get to this gorgeous valley a wide flat meadow with lots of flowers and trees and everything's in bloom. You can see red and yellow and blue flowers and the fragrance is just incredible. The sweet flowers and the trees and the air is so clean and green smelling. It's, it's just beautiful. We find a place to have lunch. We have rice and stir fried vegetables, which is kind of typical of there. And then we start looking at the town, all the little shops. There's a little sign off to the side of this building that's got a lot of clip art on it. And the clip art is indicating that they do massage. It's got a clip art of massage, a clip art of acupuncture, a clip art of uh, cupping, which if you don't know what cupping is, they put a um, glass ball on whatever problem area you have, and then they light a candle on the other end of it and it creates a vacuum and it sucks out all the toxins. 
we go into the shop after I talk Dale into it and they sit us down for tea, which is also typical in Nepal that they're gonna give you tea before you engage in business. And after the tea, we just, we pick our services and I decide I'm gonna have a massage and a cupping because I've got lower back pain that I wanna try cupping. I've never done it before. We, go, we each go into our little rooms and it's a typical massage room, narrow rectangular room with a massage bed with little face hole, the obnoxious music that's supposed to help you relax that you know, kind of music that makes me crazy. But I get undressed and I get on the table on my stomach with my head in the, in the head hole and the sheets over me. And I wait for my massage. Someone comes in after a couple of minutes and they start massaging my right shoulder. And it's kind of an odd massage because it's pretty localized and small, but it feels really good. And then someone else comes in and starts doing my left shoulder in the same sort of way. And two more people come in and they're doing my middle back and two more and they're doing my lower back. And then my thighs and I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? This is the strangest massage. And I kind of lift my head and I look behind and it's cats. I have eight cats needing me and just and they're purring and they move their paws here and there and they're just having a good time and it's the best massage I've ever had. They finish doing my back, the cats do, and someone comes in and tells me to flip over. They do my front and then they come in and tell me to flip over again so they can cut my backside. And they come in, the therapists do, and they rub some sort of oil on my back, which I figure is to seal the cup. And it smells funny. It smells kind of fishy and olive oily. And, but that's okay. Um, and they come in and instead of this that I expected, it's more like a and kind of rhythmical. Plus they're still massaging me. So again, I get up and I turn around and it's a cat again that's kneading but also it's the kind of cat that, that uh, suckles while it needs. So it's going on my back. And actually it feels pretty good. We finish the massage, get dressed. Dale and I are on our way again, hiking. And I'm starting to think, what's, what's with that tea? Did they put something weird in the tea or something? I look at Dale. And I asked him, so Dale, how was your massage? How do you feel? Because I feel great. And Dale says, it was really good. It was kind of weird, but I shouldn't have asked for the acupuncture. <laughs> That's <a> great ending. <laughs> Oh, funny. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you. Okay, so um, while I'm laughing, um, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, you sort of covered it. I, I really want to hone my lying and other people who want to hone it. Seattle uh, Storytellers Guild is having a liar's workshop on May 1. Um, I think I shared the information with Ed and he shared it with everybody, right, Ed? Yes, I passed it on. Yeah, so anyway, um, I'm relatively new, like Ed said. And um, how about teaching? You said you taught and with stories? With yeah, yeah, I mostly taught research methods and statistics at a little college here. And um, I tried as often as I could to use stories to illustrate points, which is tricky in statistics, but I do it anyway. Um, 
And I really like teaching those courses, but I'm so happy to be retired now. Yeah, very much. It's pretty awesome. Well, I, I wrote a grant to go to the National Storytelling um, Festival in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And when I came back, I had to do workshops on how to do storytelling in any classes. So we had a lot of math professors and nursing. It was, it was great. It was fantastic. Cool. Of course, you can use stories in any class. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Okay, so let's move on to our next storyteller now that I've got the order, hopefully correct. Uh, this is Colleen Bolin. Um, she is an author, a collage artist, a workshop presenter, and a storyteller. Uh, she owns a healing arts practice called Flowing Stillness. And she's also part of the Seattle Storytellers Guild. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So please welcome Colleen Bolin. Thank you. I have two goals. One is not to get robbed, drugged, or jailed while I'm in Greece. And the other is to learn Greek. Uh, it's 1980, I'm 22 years old, and I'm in Athens, Greece with my traveling buddy and friend, Jan. And she has just found these cheap tickets to Istanbul. And she wants to know if I wanna go. And I say, yeah, that'd be great because she and I are both gonna be doing an intensive language program in Greek starting in two weeks. And this would be a, a great break and a way to see a Muslim country. So we take the flight, we land in Istanbul, we drop off our backpacks at the youth hostel and we start wandering through the city. And the city is teeming with women wearing head coverings and the men and the women both are wearing long like robe coats. And after a little while, we start feeling uncomfortable because we're wearing t-shirts and tight jeans and uh, we slip into a tea shop and sitting in the corner is this group of people who kind of, they look American and they wave us over and we get some peppermint tea and we go and sit with them. And they turn out to be exchange students going to the University of Istanbul. And they tell us all about living in Istanbul and we're having a great time. And Jan and I are just thinking about leaving when this man comes over and he introduces himself as Malky. And he's got this almond skin and curly hair, raven black eyes. And he sits down next to me and we're talking. And he says, how about I take you and Jan to the Grand Bazaar? And we're like, oh, that'd be great to have an escort. We would like that. And, and in fact, I am so excited about going with Malky that I drop my purse on the floor and everything scatters. And now I'm on the floor mortified, picking things up and two of the students get out of their chairs and they start to help me. And as they're helping me, they whisper, do not go with Melky. He is a bad and dangerous person. And I'm kind of perplexed because he seems nice and he's smoking hot. Uh, so I, I think about it for a while and I dither and then I go, oh, it'll be an adventure. So Malky and Jen and I are walking up to the Grand Bazaar and Malky takes my hand and I turn to him and I say, you know, the people at the tea shop said that you're a, you're a bad man. He says, oh yeah, I'm a bad boy. I, I think arrogant, maybe a rebel, I don't know. But you know, we, we keep going and we go to the Grand Bazaar and they're like 500 stalls with hand knotted carpets and silver jewelry, spices piled high, all these beautiful things. We go out to dinner and afterwards, Malky asked me if I wanna go over to his place. And Jan and I kind of talk about it. We go, he's been a, a gentleman to us. Yes, no problem. So she goes back to the youth hostel and I go to Malky's place, which uh, turns out to be kind of like a, a cheap motel room with a double bed and a freestanding sink, a hot plate, toilet down the hall. And we're sitting on the bed because it's the only place to sit. And we're talking and hugging and he kind of leans in to give me a kiss when there's a knock on the door. 
and we both startle and we get up to, and we're standing at the door and he opens it up and there's this couple there. They're about my age, but their eyes are like just pinpricks and they have this vacant hollowness to their look that I've never seen before. Not even people in college who smoked a lot of marijuana. And I realized the people in the tea shop were right. Malky is a dangerous man. He's a drug dealer, probably opium. And this, this is his clientele. He grabs something off the bureau and he goes into the hallway and oh, my heart just starts pounding. I, 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 I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. And I, I turn and I look out the window and it's a second story window, but I'm thinking of jumping. Um, and I'm still standing there when Malky comes back in and he puts his hands on my waist and I'm hoping he can't hear or feel my heart just pounding. And before I can say anything, there's another knock. And I think that it's the couple that has come back. But when Malky opens the door, there's kind of this silence and I turn around to see why and he's just frozen. And in the doorway is this burly Turkish police officer. And I see my life pass before me. I am going to die in a Turkish prison, a dirty, smelly Turkish prison. Because who would believe that I don't know what he's got in this room? And the police officer looks around Malki at me and says, Khalid Bolin? <gasps> Yes, yes. And then he reaches in his pocket and I don't know if he's gonna pull out a gun or handcuffs and he pulls out a passport and he says, you dropped this in the tea shop and the people there said we could probably find you here. <gasps> the people in the tea shop, they're saving me from my own stupidity. Oh, I take the passport and I say, officer, would you do me one more favor? Would you walk me home? It's dark and, and, and I don't feel comfortable going by myself. And he looks Melky up and down and he says, yes. And I put my passport in the zipper part of my purse. I nod to Melky goodbye. And I go out into the fresh night air, having avoided being robbed, drugged or jailed. I had those same kind of feelings over, <laughs> over in some of those countries. <laughs> Very good, excellent story. So can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I belong to the Seattle Storytelling Guild and have been a part of that for about two years. And um, like other people in the group, I recently published a book in September called Savoring Life Spiritual Moments about finding the magic in everyday life. Nice. Oh, very good. Yeah. And, um, and how about storytelling? What are the kinds of stories you like to tell? I like to tell personal stories. Um, and I really love telling lies. They are so much fun. Um, here in Seattle during um, what used to be normal times, we had the Folklife Festival and they had a liars telling contest every year. And it, it's just so much fun to be able to create, you know, if it's not going well, you can have it go any way you want. You just switch it around and <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll, we'll move on to our next storyteller and I pronounced his name wrong once. I'm going to see if I can get it right this time. Ken Carnes. Is that correct? Close enough. Carnes. Carnes, all right. So he had a 42 year career um, teaching and he uses a wide variety of genres including folk tales, legends, folklore and memoir. Um, he hails from the New Jersey area. So we get someone from the East Coast. Thank you so much and you are now on. A very close friend of mine, Jacques Leblanc from Saskatchewan, Canada, 
was taking his 50 mile before breakfast stroll just to whet his appetite when he stopped. Uh, there was cacophony in the usually quiet forest. Jacques jumped onto a nearby spruce, scrambled to the top, wrapped himself around the spire and surveyed the countryside. Sacre! There in the valley was a convoy of trucks, tractors, tree chopping machines eating their way through the forest. Jacques was furious. Now I gotta tell you my buddy Jacques, he, he's a lumberjack himself. <laughs> he's gotta harvest one mature tree every year just for his personal supply of toothpicks. But he had never seen or even imagined a forest where, where every single tree had been cut. He jumped from the top of that 100 foot spruce, landed to the ground with a crash. Them scientist seismologists down in San Francisco, they yelled earthquake. Well, Jacques ran down that mountain fast and hard, so fast, his footsteps measured about a mile apart. And his footsteps left impressions that have since filled with rainwater and have become mountain lakes. Well, Jacques got down to the valley and he yelled, stop! And those workers, they had to stop at the sound of Jacques's voice, but they had to wait a full 10 minutes for Jacques's voice to stop echoing from mountain to mountain to mountain to mountain to mountain to mountain. Well, the, the foreman, the boss of this project approached my buddy Jacques. Who, who, who the heck are, are you? I am Jacques, Jacques Leblanc. And this is my home, Saskatchewan, Canada, that you are making unfit to live. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, buddy, but we're logging this land. And that boss, he retreated to his pickup truck where he locked himself inside. Now Jacques looked at the countryside that he knew so well. Oh no! There was a, a century old fir tree that was special to Jacques. Jacques remembered how when he was just a toddler, he wandered into the forest only to be caught in one of them Saskatchewan squalls that comes out of nowhere. The wind screamed, the snow and the sleet came down in sheets. Poor little baby Jacques was up to his neck in snow when he found those beautiful low sweeping branches of that fir tree. He crawled underneath. He found a hole among the roots. He climbed in, crawled along until he came to a wall. The wall was soft. The wall was warm. Baby Jacques cuddled up to that soft, warm wall and fell asleep. He didn't wake up until he felt a long, raspy, wet tongue licking him all over. When that wall woke up, well, that mama grizzly, she couldn't count. She had two of her own cubs. She just assumed Jacques was one of hers. So Jacques spent that whole spring with his new grizzly siblings, the cubs, and his new grizzly mama. And now Jacques stood there with streams of tears running down his cheeks as he wondered where his adoptive family would find a place to live. I will not move, he announced. Well, a boss came out, looked up to, to the driver who was sitting up, up in the clouds. Hey, Joe, start your machine, push the sky aside. And that's what Joe did. The machine was started with a rumble, a roar. The smell of diesel fumes filled the air. The wheels began to turn. They didn't turn, they spun because Jacques had put his shoulder against the cold metal grill of that machine and he was pushing and pushing and those wheels were spinning and spinning and Jacques was pushing and pushing, overheating. Rivers of sweat were pouring from him, making a muddy mess of the ground below, but he didn't give up. The wheels of that machine spun and spun and spun, spun until it spun itself right into the ground. Jacques had won. Now the boss, he should have just taken his crew and left right then and there. 
Oh, but he was stubborn. No man's going to beat my machines. And you know, he couldn't see the green of the forest. All he could see was the green of that paper stuff that he kept in his wallet. So one at a time, he sent his machines after Jacques. And one at a time, Jacques held his ground until when that sun set in the western Saskatchewan sky, each one of those machines was buried right to its roof. And the workers left, but Jacques didn't leave. He got himself a great big chain, hooked up those trucks and tractors and tree chopping machines, dragged them to a junkyard, came back, went to the forest where he by hand pulled out seedlings and transplanted them lovingly. He spread acorns and chestnuts and walnuts and hickory nuts and cherry pits and maple seeds, and he waited for them to germinate. He did not leave until there was once more a sea of green. Now Jacques dragged himself back to his mountain cabin where without even unlacing his mud cake boots, he fell into his bed and fell into a deep, deep sleep. And as far as I know, he's still sleeping it off. <laughs> the last time I went to visit him, Jacques, wake up, uh-uh, Jacques, wake up, nothing. So I want to tell you folks, if you're ever in a place called Saskatchewan, you might be lying outside at night, looking up at that ebony sky with those shiny sparkly diamonds. You might feel the ground shake. You might hear a rumble in the, the distance and your first instinct is going to be to yell earthquake, but you can relax. It won't be an earthquake. It'll just be my good buddy, Jacques Leblanc snoring in his sleep. Yeah, all right. Hey, I hope I made it in run. time. I, I didn't see the cards. I didn't see uh, the card lady. Yeah, were you there, Karen? Karen. I was there and you made the time, Ken. Okay. You okay. were seven, I didn't see you. 17. Oh. So, well, let's try and make sure somehow that Karen's there. So maybe when we start the next teller, we'll ask if you can see Karen up there, okay? Um, so we make sure that happens. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ken. Well, we, well, I told you I'm from New Jersey. So it's 1046 PM right now. Right. And you know, in my town, they hire a civil servant to physically roll up the sidewalks at eight o'clock. <laughs> And, and, you know, I'm going to be 71 years old in two weeks. And there's a law here that says if you're 70 year, years old, you've got to be in bed at 10 o'clock. So I want to let you know that, that I'm practicing civil disobedience here. I'm breaking the law just to be with you guys tonight. Nice. Well, we will write you a letter of support. Okay, good. Thanks. Now, I'm a teacher, 42 years retired. Um, what did you teach? Uh, grammar school and then uh, sixth grade. I left that sixth reading, uh, teaching sixth grade language arts. Had a good run, loved it, no regrets. So, how did you get into storytelling? Well, my first year, I got hired as a third grade teacher back in 1973 when there were no men in the primary grade. Right. right. You know, the, the principal's interviewing me with her cigarette in her hand, and she says, "I need a man in third grade," and I thought. What the heck kind of kids they got here? Anyway, I found out that kids listen, weren't listening to my wonderful, excellent lessons. But if I told the story, they remembered every single detail. Yes. So that's how I got started. Nice. Very nice. Okay. We are going to move on to our next storyteller, Dave Tarvin. He is from our local group, the Sacramento Storytelling Guild. Storytellers Guild, and um, we've seen Dave in different different genres, different events. He, sometimes he might be wearing a railroad outfit, telling you stories of the railroad, or a cowboy. We've had some really great stories from Dave, and we're ready to listen to some more. So thank you for participating, Dave. Can you see, can you see Karen? 
Uh, I can see her. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're ready to go right now. So people are always asking me, they say, Dave, how can you afford that beautiful classic car? And I always give them the same answer, cheese balls. You see, years ago, I was out fishing and I was making cheese balls, favorite bait for the California gold speckled brown trout. And I was making those cheese balls. Now I was making number 31. I'd already made about 30 of them and I had a nice pile right next to my fishing pole. And I finished number 31 and I went to put it down onto the pile and there were only 10. I looked up and I could see a bunch of squirrels running off with those cheese balls and I could swear that I heard them chuckling. And I said, hey, you can't be running off with my cheese ball, that's my fishing bait. And then all of a sudden I noticed there's squirrels everywhere and I looked over to where my gear was and there were squirrels everywhere. They were the Northern California gold crested ground squirrels. And they were in my backpack tearing it apart. They had gone through my tackle box and knocked stuff all over the ground. Three of them knocked over my thermos of fresh hot coffee and two of them were on a tub of Grandma Tarvin's Yukon Gold potato salad and they were fornicating. That was too much. Nobody messes with grandma's potato salad. So I took that cheese ball and I threw it at them and I said, you get out of here. And they took off, but one of them, as he ran through my tackle box, he got my favorite lure caught on his tail. Well, I wasn't about to lose my favorite lure, so I took off chasing him. And the next thing I know, I'm running, 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 running through the forest. And all of a sudden, I break out into this clearing and I am standing at the base of Dig Darn Mountain. And all up the side of the face are all these holes and all the squirrels are running into these little burrow holes. And I was standing there watching them and then I looked down and I could see my lure. I took a couple of steps forward. I reached down to grab that lure and suddenly the earth just gave out from underneath me and I dropped about three feet right on my butt. I got up and I started dusting myself off and there were squirrels that were in this burrow that had collapsed and they were running around all over the place. And then I saw this little flint. And so I reached down and I picked up this pebble and I rubbed it between my fingers and I, I bit on it. It was a gold nugget. And then I saw there was hundreds in that collapsed burrow in the dirt. And I started picking them up and shoving them in my pockets until my pockets were full. And I stood there and I looked up at that dig darn mountain and all those holes. And I thought, how many burrows are up in there with food caches with all these gold nuggets? The squirrels know, but how do I get those squirrels to give me those nuggets? Well, I remembered back to my undergrad days that summer that I worked in the behavioral lab training animals, including squirrels, to do retrieval. I ran back to my fishing spot and I started making those cheese balls. The pile got bigger and bigger and bigger and the squirrels, they were watching me and they came filtering down off that mountain. They came filtering through those trees and they made a little semi-circle in front of me about, well, about 20 feet away. There was 75, 80, 90, 100, 200, 300 of them. And I made this big pile. And then I thought, how do I communicate to them what I want? So I held up a cheese ball, I held up a nugget, and I did this. That didn't seem to work. So I held it out of the cheese ball, I held out the nugget, and I did this. That didn't seem to work. I was kind of sad at that point. I thought, this isn't going to work. And then I had another bright idea. 
I popped one in my mouth, I chewed it up and I rubbed my tummy and then I held up that gold nugget. Well, one of those squirrels stepped out from the group. He stood up on his hind legs, he put his hands on his hips and he started chirping at me. Chirp, 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 chirp. Now I don't speak squirrel, but I took a risk that he was maybe asking for one of those cheese balls. So I picked one up and I held it out to him and he came and he took it. He smiled and he looked at me and then he turned his head a little bit and he spit three times and out popped from his big old cheeks, three golden nuggets right at my feet. Well, then those squirrels, they all lined up, said nice and orderly, a big long line and they came up one at a time and I picked up a cheese ball and I handed it to them and then they would walk over next to me and they would spit out gold nuggets. Two, three, four, five, sometimes eight, nine. And pretty soon that pile got pretty big, but then I ran out of those cheese balls. So I left them all the cheese that I had left and I packed all those gold nuggets into my backpack and I headed back to town. I was able to cash that out and I was able to buy my car, a fully restored 1968 limited edition sunset lit gold nugget Ford Mustang. And I drive it every day. <laughs> Fantastic, Dave. Well, now that I know about that, I'm going to be visiting you a little bit more often. We're not that far away. <laughs> Well, it's in a secret spot, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Dave Tarvin, and uh, I live in Auburn, California. I actually live in the gold country, so that's why I sometimes tell tall tales about gold and gold nuggets, that kind of stuff. And uh, But before COVID hit, I did local storytelling, that kind of stuff but I also did creative storytelling with seniors in various facilities, but I haven't been able to do that since COVID. But I think I finally figured out a way where I can engage them in their facilities and then do the stories on a radio show. So I'm currently working on that. Oh, and when I do my creative storytelling, what that is, is they help me to pick out all the pieces of the story and then I improv the story for them right there. So, and I improv most of my stories. I don't write them out, write them down, that kind of stuff. So I love stories and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. And Dave, tell them your, uh, your first name as you, and when you were a storyteller. Like oh. <laughs> well, I believe in having a little stage persona. So I started out as uh, the coffee bar cowboy and I wore a whole cowboy Get up. I was so authentic that one day I went into the local feed store to go and buy something and some cowboy started telling me about all of his problems with the cattle that he was raising and I had to tell him, look, brother, I'm just a coffee bar cowboy. <laughs> I don't know nothing about cattle. Very nice. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dave. And we are now going on to our next storyteller. His name is Kent Cross. And I bet I've got that one right. Um, so you're going to spotlight him, Andrew? Okay, excellent. Um, Kent is a retired software engineer who is part of the San Diego Storytelling Guild and has been telling stories with them for a long time. So welcome, Kent Cross. Well, thank you very much. Uh, nice, nice to be here. Um, I... I'm, I'm here in San Diego and I went to school in San Diego way back when I was a, a freshman uh, at San Diego State. One of my uh, classmates came up to me one day and said, hey, you want to go to Big Bear and go skiing? And I said, sure, why not? Now, I'm sure that uh, especially you people that are in um, New Jersey, uh, skiing is probably not the first thing you think of when you think of San Diego. I mean, you got uh, you got the beach, you got, you know, so baseball team, you got a zoo. Um, but when I came down to San Diego, I had absolutely no ski equipment whatsoever. So when I said, sure, I had no idea what I was gonna do. 
So I, um, he said, great, I'll pick you up after I'm off my shift uh, tonight. So I had to run off and quickly get some ski equipment to, to keep warm, if nothing else. And so I got, um, got on my bicycle, bicycle down to the Goodwill, and I went in there and I found a left glove pretty darn quickly. Couldn't find a right one, they're all too small. Um, found a coat, then I went digging into the hat pile and I found a hat that I could wear, no problem. Dug a little bit further and I found a, a pale pink mitten with a fringe on it. Um, it was too big for me, but it had like a leather strap that I could just latch the strap down and just lock it onto my hand. One other interesting thing about this, this mitten is that it had written on it, Antarctica 1970, 1972. So I figured, yeah, that, that mitten had seen a few things and it's certainly gonna keep me warm. So I gathered all my stuff, put my backpack, bicycle back home. And the guy picked me up after a shift. We went off to Big Bear, which is the local ski resort uh, in the area. They found a lodge for us. And of course, as you all know, you have to, when you're going from San Diego to Big Bear, you gotta stop off at Cafe B's. And we did. And as a result, we got to um, the lodge really, really late at night. Uh, but that's another story. So we got in the lodge, went straight to the dormitory, went straight to bed. Got up the next morning, had breakfast, said, let's go out and go skiing. And so um, I went back in to get all my stuff, found my coat, found my hat, found my, my glove, and it was nowhere to be found. And I went outside in, in, into the common area and to ask my friends, have you seen Mitten at all? And there it was, it was lying by the uh, fireplace. I thought, that's odd, it must have fallen out of my, my backpack when I, uh, when I came in. So I put on my hand, strapped the thing way down so it wouldn't fall off, and it went out, went out the door. Now, I'm sure you know how the, uh, these doors at the, at the lodges work. It's a two door, it's an airlock sort of thing, where you have a uh, door on the inside that keeps the warm in, and you open that up, there's kind of like an airlock area, and then there's the door on the outside that keeps the cold out. So I grabbed onto that with my right hand, pushed it forward, went out, and this blast of cold air came in. And um, my mitten clamped down onto the doorknob as if to say, I ain't going out there, I, it's cold. Well, except obviously since I was wearing the mitten, it probably would have sounded like whoa, 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 whoa. So, but I'm still going full steam ahead to get out the thing, get out. The, and so naturally when your hand is stuck, but your body's still moving, something's gotta give. My feet fell up, went up, and I just went, fell down, and I landed on, on the ground, uh, still hanging onto the doorknob. And of course, um, my friends, being college friends, stepped over me. I said, you know, watch out for the first step, it's a doozy. They stopped and I said, we'll meet you outside. Yeah, okay, and they, and they walked on. So I worked my way up, and, hand still there with my left hand I was able to pry my fingers off of the doorknob and I took took the mitten shoved it into my coat pocket and I went outside walked down and I caught up with my friends I looked over to the side and I saw there was a coffee shop over there to the side I probably shouldn't have done this but I said to them in a loud voice man I'm glad there's a coffee shop over there because we're going to need to get warm up after we go, uh, after we do our skiing. Well, immediately my hand popped out of my, my uh, pocket, pulled me over this way and sh shoved me way over and grabbed onto the doorknob of the coffee shop, opened it up, dragged me to the coffee shop and slammed the door. I guess I was about to have some coffee right then and there. I ordered a grande from the guy behind the thing. No, wait a minute, this was in the seventies. Grandes hadn't been invented yet. I had a large uh, coffee. And I put it in my right hand and I immediately felt my fingers starting to relax with the heat of the coffee. And I realized, oh my God, you really don't like cold. You must have had an awful period of time inside Antarctica. Tell you what, if you can get me through this, this time, I will uh, go to San Diego and I'll never take you out. You'll never be cold again. Is that okay? I felt this feeling in my side and I looked over here, the, the guy behind the counter was looking at me strange and said, do you mind I'm talking to my mitten over here? And I kind of walked out the door 
and down the stairs, and he was just still holding a cup of coffee. We got to the place where he gets the skis, and have you ever tried to put on skis and poles holding a large cup of coffee? It's very difficult to do. And so as I was struggling and, and all this stuff, I spilled it on my pant leg, and I immediately said, Okay, yeah, I guess the the Zoom filter kicked in there. Um, you can figure out what I said, but I it hurt, it hurt, and I grabbed the coffee and I threw it into the trash can, and I grabbed the ski pole and I put it in my right glove because I'm going to go out and go skiing. Well, I made two mistakes at that point. I just upset the, I upset the mitten, and I just gave a weapon. Um, first thing it did was it started swinging around like there was an orchestra conductor conducting a swarm of bees. Uh, then it started to get some strategy. Did you know that it's possible to hit yourself in the head with a, with a ski pole? I learned that lesson three times that day. It bang, 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 bang. Then it went after my feet. Kind of got smart because I went over and landed in a snow pile. At that point, the, the strap popped off of the mitten. It the mitten jumped off my hand. And it bounced like a jackrabbit back to the lodge. Well, I was kind of sore. I picked myself back up and returned the ski equipment. I paid for the ski pole. And I worked my way back to the lodge. Now, I was expecting the mitten to be in front of the fireplace again, but it wasn't there. I looked in the dairy. I looked in the, um, you know, the, the eating area. It wasn't there either. Until I went into the, uh, the kitchen, the nice warm kitchen, there was a display of oven mitts hanging over the stove. And there was one oven mitt that was a pale pink oven mitt with a, with a white fringe on it. And I knew that was my mitt because, and, and especially since whenever I made direct eye contact with it, um, it looked away. It, it, didn't, it kind of twitched a little bit saying, no, no, I'm not the mitten. I'm not the mitten you're looking for. Uh, it, it's out there. It's outside somewhere. I decided, you know, You've had enough, um, and, I, and, I, and I let it hang there. I went to the uh, lost and found box, found two gloves that, that fit me, and went out and went skiing with my friend. Sunday afternoon, when it was time to leave, I checked in in the kitchen. It was still hanging there, and I bet it's probably still hanging there to this very day. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the story. So um, tell us a little bit more about yourself, Kent. Well, I, I guess I'm fairly new. I, I, sort, I sort of wish I had all the stories that other people have. You know, I haven't written any books. I, I have great kids uh, and, you know, and a great family and, that are listening in. So I'm, I'm glad that they're there. Um, I didn't write any books about them, unfortunately. <laughs> um, start. I guess I have to now since, you know, since they're listening in, I have to come up with something um, that um, let's, uh, I, I did go to San Diego State. Um, San Diego is not known for, for uh, snow, um, but you know, been, been to Big Bear many times since then. And what kind of stories do you like to tell with the uh, San Diego group? Um, generally, um, extrapolations of stuff that, that have actually happened uh, to me. Yeah. Um, like, you know, um, and so uh, they, they seem to like it. Um, unfortunately, I joined just as COVID hit. So I really was only able to physically attend one meeting. The rest has all been on Zoom. So yeah. I understand things work a whole lot better um, when, uh, the, uh, when people are actually in the audience. Um, Definitely. So. Yeah. Yeah, we are all looking forward to the time we can get back to in person. And I know a lot of us, uh, including our organization, a lot of storytelling groups really like the Zoom aspect of it because we can connect with people from all over. So I know right. a lot, quite a few of the groups are going to, when they get back into in person stuff, we are going to going to set up a camera and learn how to do that and Zoom it at the same time. So. Um, yeah. I'm sure many groups will do that. It's been a nice technology, but it definitely is not like, you know, it's been nice for connecting with people all over the world, but it's definitely not. It's definitely not and you really do have to stop off in Cafe B's. It's really good. Yeah. 
Nice. Wasn't lying about that. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we are ready to go to our last storyteller. This is Elaine Stanley. She has been telling stories uh, professionally since 1994. She was involved with the Bay Area Storytelling Festival. She's the co-founder of the Do Tell Story Swap Group in the Santa Rosa, California area. And uh, she loves to tell fables, folk tales, um, personal stories. And she's done this for quite a while. So please welcome Elaine Stanley. Can you see Karen? You're on mute right now. Elaine, you're on mute. For what it's worth, I couldn't see yeah, Karen either. I, I can't see her. I'll, I'll find her in just a minute. Every time you turn the screen to a different teller, she moves. <laughs> yeah. So I can't, can we get Karen back here? Yeah, I'm, I'm working at it. I'm trying to find her in the line. Oh, I saw her just now, just a minute. Now I see her. You see her? I do. Okay, so um, we are ready to roll and take the Okay. Lead. Well, my name is Elaine, and I was born in Virginia. I left when I was three months old, however, but not on my own. My father was in the Air Force. So I grew up moving on average every two years of my whole growing up life. I lived in many states and London, England and Tokyo, Japan. I graduated from high school in Tokyo and the summer my father was shipped back to the States was they put uh, several of the families that were in Japan on a ship and sent us back that way. We crossed the international date line on my 20th birthday which means I got to celebrate my 20th birthday two days in a row, which probably makes me about 20 years older than I am right now. But anyway, we got into California and I turned to my dad and I said, we've lived in Japan for a long time. You know, I, I'm not ready to go punch a time card or go to college. I wanna, I wanna go find out what my birth state is like. I was born in Virginia, but I've not really seen it. I don't know what Virginia's like. And my father said, hmm, tell you what, I'll give you your inheritance now. You can go back to Virginia and you can do whatever you want to do. But when the money runs out, don't call home for more. Get a job. If you want to go to school, we'll help you. Have fun. Bye. And off we went. They took off with Southern California and I stood there with a nice chunk of money in my hands going, how do I get to Virginia cheap? Greyhound bus. Well, it only took a few days to get back to Virginia, but it felt like 10 years. That bus stopped every time you turned around. But Virginia is a beautiful state. There were those Blue Ridge Mountains running down the western side of the state, and I went, ooh, this is beautiful. I went up into the mountains, and I thought about it, and I said, you know, if I found a good cabin, I could live off the land. I might never, ever have to get a job, punch a time card, go to college or anything. I could just live there. And so I went out, and I bought all the tools I needed to garden, fish, and hunt. And I found a cabin. Well, it was more of a shack. And um, it kept the rain out mostly and had a beautiful stone fireplace. And I found out living off the land isn't so easy. It's a lot of hard work. And it takes learning because every animal in the woods would come after your garden and get your food before you could get to it. So I learned a lot and pretty soon I was gardening to where I was bringing in food that would keep me going. It took me two years to learn how to fish well enough till I knew where the fish were running at the time of the day or that time of the year that I was out. And I could get, come back with a whole passel of fish. And it took me three years to really learn how to hunt 
so that when I went out, I'd come back with meat for the table. But one fall morning I awoke and I stretched and oh, it was one of the most beautiful days I've ever seen. The sky was blue, there were puffy white clouds and the sun was shining through those changing fall leaves of green, yellow, orange and red leaves. It looked like sunlight through a cathedral stained glass window. And I realized I hadn't had any meat on my table for at least two days. I think it was time to go hunting and it was a perfect day. So I grabbed the gun from over the fireplace, threw it over my shoulder and out the front door I went, stomping down the path, humming to myself. The sky was blue, the air smelled so sweet. And so I walked. And of course you can't hunt when you're humming. But I had the whole day and it was a gorgeous day. So I just enjoyed the morning. I'd walked probably an hour or so when I looked off to my left and there was a pheasant. I swung the gun down fast, shot, gone, gone, I missed. Ah, I had all day. I threw the gun up over my shoulder again, quit humming, and moved down the path a little quieter. I'd probably hiked another hour or so when I saw a little rabbit off to my right. I spun around really quick, bam, I shot. Oh, gone, gone, I missed. I checked the gun, I had one bullet left. I checked my, oh my gosh, I hadn't stuck any ammo in my pockets. All I had was one bullet left. And my grandpa, who had hunted in these mountains his entire life, said, you go out hunting and you don't get something to eat with three shots, you deserve to go hungry. Well, I'd had three shots and I wasted two and all I had was one left. So I stood there in that path and I started my mantra. The next thing I shoot at, I will hit. I must have repeated that line about 10 times. The very next thing I shoot at, I will hit. And then I began to move so stealth like you could not hear my boots crack a leaf or twig beneath my feet. So I moved through the woods and just as I was about to draw my gun up, I saw off to the left a buck deer with a rack of antlers so beautiful you couldn't imagine. I've never seen any that day. So I looked and pulled my gun up into position. When I heard a noise off to my right, I looked over there and there come a black bear. I looked at the bear and the deer and the deer and the bear. It didn't seem right to leave either one. So I reached into my belt and I pulled up a hunting knife and threw it in an elm tree just between the two animals. I took aim at that knife blade and I shot, bam! That bullet hit the knife blade split right in two. One half killed the bear and the other half killed the deer. But that wasn't the best part. For the sheer force of that bullet hitting the knife blade knocked the knife out of the tree and sent it spinning up in the air like a big old helicopter blade just as a flock of ducks was flying overhead. That <laughs> night, killed clean and dressed seven of those ducks before falling back to earth. Point first, kill on a rabbit. Woo, I couldn't believe my luck. I went running over to check my deer when I tripped over a turtle and fell head first into the creek. I came up sputtering and wiping water off my face and looked over and that turtle was on his back. Good thing, because turtle soup and fall really. Well, I spent the rest of it, oh, took me 20 minutes to get out of the creek because my boots were so full of trout. And I'd spent me the rest of the day tying up and dragging home everything that I caught. But you know, it weren't a bad day's catch for only having one bullet left. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm going hung with you next time I go out on Oh boy, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Went over. <laughs> thank you for uh, ending our- um, Well, thank you for having me. Nice, it was nice fun. Event. And so please go ahead and give us a little bit more about yourself. Oh my gosh, you heard about <laughs> <laughs> You didn't hear enough about my life. <laughs>
Well, I worked with Stagebridge when I lived in Oakland and went into schools and taught storytelling, did storytelling. Can you say what Stagebridge is for people that don't know? Stagebridge is a theater company that will take um, seniors and teach them how to act, um, tell stories, do plays, um, have activities where they can go out into the community and work at other senior centers entertaining seniors or go into the schools, do improv with the kids and have an interaction or even storytelling uh, with the children so that uh, they're putting elders and children are bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. And that's what the stage bridge is. So it was a lot of fun to go. Excellent. Uh, so Andrew, we're, it looks like we're probably going to have eight minutes or so more into the um, breakout room. You're sending the judges to the breakout room now? Is that right? And me. Uh, yes, I'll send them off for 10 minutes. Okay, so I will, I'm going to um, finish the event with, uh, with a story for you um, while we're doing that. Okay, so Andrew, you want to spotlight me hey. after you get things set up? They should be on Karen their way. I has something to say. I'm sorry? What did you say, Never Karen? mind. Karen was signaling, so. I guess she's off oh. to a breakout room now. Okay. Okay. Um, just a second, Ed. I'll okay. All right. I'll highlight you in a second here. If I can get, I got to get Elaine. Oh yeah, she's good. Okay. Um, get you back on there. Uh, spotlight for everyone. Okay, there you go. All right, and so. Wherever I'm at in the story, when you bring people back, let me know and I'll just end the story. Well, yeah, okay. okay. Power left. Ken is screaming as we're in a canoe going into a class four rapids on the 11 Point River in the Missouri Ozarks. Now, he was an expert canoeist, and I was spending two days canoeing down the river with him, and we were going to meet another buddy further down the river. Now he told me to power left, and but he forgot to say one thing about that. When you power left, meaning he's got the back and I got to dig in and get us through this rapid, you cannot lean over. And when I heard power left, I put all my strength into it, leaning to the left and the canoe went like this and all our gear fell out. We made it through the rapids. I lost my oar, but he got us through the rapids we finally found the oar. It took about an hour. We dried off some of our gear and we continued down the river. Now we had many eventful uh, experiences that day, swinging off of rope swings and flipping into the water, catching bass and, and um, cooking up lunch. And it's just, if you've ever been, this is the Missouri Ozarks, but it goes into the Arkansas Ozarks. And I was also thinking of that movie that many of you have probably seen called Deliverance. Well, I was a little worried about that, but um, the Ken was an expert canoeist, so he got us through, and the rest of the rapids were easy because he and Loy were going to go the next day in the real rough parts of the river. So we met Loy that night in Arkansas in the, by a bridge, and we camped out for the night, and it was the first time I'd ever seen meteorite showers. It was unbelievable. Well, that day, Ken and Loy took off, and I drove around to a buddy of Loy's down in Arkansas, and that's where they were going to pull off, and we were going to have a party. Now, the guy, it was in a little holler there in Arkansas, and he said, he said, you know, um, we need some fish. How about you? You ever fished? I said, yeah, I grew up fishing. I grew up in the San Juan Islands. My uncle was a salmon fisherman. I fish all the time. So, well, I got a bass boat you can take out for the day. All right. Fantastic. He said, I got to go to town. We're going to have about 30 people over, so catch as many fish as you can. Fantastic. So I went out, and within one hour, I had eight good-sized bass. But I was out of, I was out of bait. 
And I'm looking around trying to figure out, you know, I got a couple hours left. I got I, I got to do some more fishing. I mean, we got a lot of people coming over. And I, I'm looking around and I see a frog sitting on this rock. And I'm going, ah, I'm going to get me that frog. So I slowly made my way over in the boat to where that frog was. And I was kind of wondering why it wasn't moving. And I got really close and I looked. And the reason it wasn't moving is because it was in the mouth of a poisonous cotton mouth snake. But I'm a clever guy. I know a lot about snakes. I'm going to give me that frog. And here's the tip, you know, in case you ever get into something like this. If you grab a snake by the jaw and you're strong enough, and I was young and strong, and you hold tight, it's not going to bite you. You're stronger than the snake. So I did that. I grabbed that snake. It's going like this. I ripped out the frog. I threw it in the bait bucket. And the plan was to just throw the snake into the water. But I hadn't counted on this because it was going by my face. And I, ooh, to let it go, I, I didn't know what to do. But I did tell you I'm clever. And I looked down in the boat. And then it hit to me. I unscrewed the lid. And I brought up my fifth of Jack Daniels that I always take when I go fishing. And I poured a shot of Jack Daniels right down the gullet of that snake. And the snake's eyes rolled back in its head. And it had this really beautific grin. And it was limp. And I just dropped it in the water. I cut up that frog. I caught, oh, got 10, 10, 12 more bass. I mean, I mean, they were huge. It, it, it just, you, you probably wouldn't believe that, but they were really big. Well, I did run out of bait. And I still had about an hour left. Okay. I'm going to look for some more frogs. But before I did that, I felt this little nudging on my leg. And I looked down, and there's that cotton mouse snake. And it has a big bullfrog on its mouth. And I know it's the same one because it has that little Z on its back. It looks up at me and it looks down at the fifth of Jack Daniels. Now, one thing I you don't know about me is I'm sometimes kind of slow on the uptake. I didn't quite figure it out, but it, you know, I did it about three times looking at me, looking at the fifth of Jack Daniels. It finally dawned on me. So, but I, one thing I want you to know never trust a snake. So I reached out with my vice grip and I grabbed that snake. But it wasn't moving. In fact, the snake just spit that bullfrog right into my bait bucket. Fine. Got that fifth. Gave him two shots this time. Maybe three. And his eyes rolled back. The greatest grin you've ever seen. And it just slithered down into the water. I cut up that frog. I cut. I probably had 25 bass. I mean, I had a, like a, I don't know, a 20 pound bass in one of them. And we had a great feast. And then I came back to California. And where I live in California, they have a bass fishing contest in a town about 20 miles south of where I live. And it's in September when the bass come through. And if you win, you get $500 and you get your name on a plaque down by the river. And I've tried many years to win that. I never had. But now I thought, okay, frogs. If I get frogs, I really hadn't used those as bait before. So I went out there and it's a three day tournament, but I went every day and I caught, the last day I caught an 18 pound bass. And I knew I was gonna win with that. But they keep announcing, if, you know, once you get a big one, you know, they say, okay, Ed Lewis has an 18 pound bass. That's the bass to beat. Well, about a half hour later, this woman got a 19 pound bass. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I really wanted to win this year. And then the most unbelievable thing happened, which you probably will even have a difficult time believing. The snake from the Arkansas Ozarks had come all the way over the, the, uh, the, the Rockies, through the Sierras, like where Eric is up there and in the Sierras and the gold rush and all that, and all the way down to the Sacramento River. I don't know how long it took, but there it was. And it had a frog in its mouth. And then the cutest thing happened. Right next to him came this gorgeous cotton mouth snake. And she had eyelashes that curled up like this. 
and on the end of each eyelash were bath scales, shiny, beautiful bath scales. And then the cutest thing for me was that two little toddler snakes came up next. They all had little frogs in their mouth. And they looked up at me and I was a little slow on the uptake. I was kind of shocked that you know they would be there. But then they looked down at the fifth of Jack Daniels, which I always carry with me. And so I figured it out right away. I took that lid off and I poured it in this container I had. They just spit the frogs right into my bait bucket. And then they came up and they had a great time. Now I do want to I do want to caution you that um, don't judge a snake those snakes as parents with their toddler snakes. You know, you're not snakes, you know, I mean, you wouldn't give your toddlers, you know, Jack Daniels, but maybe that's okay for snakes, you know? So please keep your judgment in check here. Well, I took that bait and I cut that up and I caught a 25 pound bass. And if you don't believe me, you just go down to this town, it's called Real Vista, down to the docks and you'll see my name up there on the plaque, Ed Lewis. 1994 and I won that $500 and if any of you ever want to go fishing with me I can get the best bait there is and all you have to do is bring along a fifth of Jack Daniels thank you perfect timing Ed they're all done and back nice Okay, well, Angela, I mean, not Angela. Uh, Mark. Ke no, I think Karen actually is going to do it because she was doing the tallying of everything that they gave her. Oh. Karen, are you ready to announce the first, second, and third place? I am ready. Okay. I'll tell you, this was an exciting Liars Club. Uh, Liars Fun. event, I guess. And we had excellent liars, but we had three liars extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. So I am ready to enter to announce the third place winner is Eric Hurt. So Eric, you have uh, you can get a membership or $15. You can let me know what you want to do. Our second place winner with $50. Let's give a hand to Ken. <laughs> and our first place $100 winner is none other the man with all those cheese balls. Let's give a hand for Dave Tarvin. Hey. Now, Dave, I have your address, but I, Ed, I don't have Ken or Eric's address to send their winning. So if you can have, if you have that information. Well, I have their emails and then I'll send that to you and you can email them and Okay, Get what that'll you work. And Mary McGrath asked for the emails of all the participants. So uh, you probably want to get their permission if. Okay, well, so does anyone have any objections to having Mary McGrath, who's a storyteller, she, she runs story groups and poetry groups and writers groups and has been doing this for many, many years. With, that she has your information.